Good morning. Today's topic is nervous system. The nervous system is the biggest system in medicine. If you see the textbooks, three, four hundred pages are given to the nervous system. Yes, it's a very important system and don't underestimate it. Today, with the improvements in medicine, in nervous system, you will be shocked amount of improvement. A patient gets a hemiplasia, in olden days hemiplasia means then you live with that permanently, recover 50-70%. Today, within two hours if you patient you take to the hospital, neurology unit, he can dissolve the clot and the patient can become normal within few minutes. You cannot believe it. The surgery of neural brain has advanced. Forget about that. Interventional treatment. I mean, you, you only talk about heart. Everybody talks about heart, heart. Interventional treatment. Put a stent, put a stent. You can, now neurologists are putting stents. What's the problem? So, you can put stents in neurology. The surgery is advanced. Anesthesia is advanced. It is, you, you will be shocked to see the improvements. Surgery without cutting. Surgery without cutting. Have you heard of it? That is our allopathic medicine, which I am very proud of. But my whole enthusiasm goes away when the patient comes for common complaint, fever, backache, headache. Well, I can't help the patient much. Where whether you give Ayurvedic treatment, homeopathic treatment, naturopathy, allopathy. Patient recovers with passage of time. So there is nothing to be proud of that. But nervous system for GP, nothing. You don't have to know anything. Whatever I'm going to talk today and next Sunday, ne next month. But one thing I must tell you. When I used to teach nervous system in the medical college for 30 years, I was very famous for teaching nervous system. I used to tell them, patient enters first gate, look at the gate. By looking at the gate, the way in which he is walking, you can diagnose. If you miss that, then you miss the diagnosis because he lies there on the table. You examine the patient, you will find nothing. Higher centers, when you talk to him properly, like, how do you know he has no dementia? And if he has got dementia, Alzheimer's dementia today is the most common cause of dementia. And then the cranial nerves. One, two, all twelve cranial nerves to be examined. And then the motor system, power. See, a Parkinson patient says he cannot walk, he, he cannot, but you, you see the power, very good power. Tone, very important. A Parkinson patient says he can't do this, he can't. but if you look at his, the tone, to tone you, here for example, you, you find he can't do this very fast. He's rigid. Tone is increased. One sign you can diagnose is Parkinson. This man has got Parkinson. Coordination. You tell him to touch the nose and he, he goes here. His cerebellum is affected. Simple. Then the wasting. He is talking about some symptoms of hand, then you find the thigh, uh, the thinner eminence flat lies, wasted. Carpal tunnel syndrome, finished. Diagnosis is over. The patient comes and he cannot walk, he has got symptoms in the legs, and, he, and you find the deltoid is flat and stuff like this. The patient has got a lesion in the cervical cord, not low drawn. Investigate that MRI of that area. Maybe tuberculosis, maybe tum tumor. So, wasting. And of course, involuntary movements, which now we call as movement disorders. 
and which we'll be doing next next time. Then sensory system, superficial sensations, pain, cotton. If you find any area which is depigmented in the skin, whitish, first look, are there any hair there in that area? No. No hair becomes suspicious. Maybe leprosy. Take a pin, you cannot feel more suspicion, leprosy. And next you just palpate the ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve is very easy to palpate. Here you put an ulnar nerve in this patient is thick like this. So you can easily feel the ulnar nerve. Diagnosis is over, leprosy, leprotic neuritis. It's very impressive. Superficial sensation, deep sense, deep sensation is the tuning fork. I told you earlier, tuning fork if patient cannot feel the vibrations in the legs. 99% he has got diabetes without doing blood sugar. Then superficial reflexes, deep reflexes, superficial reflexes. You just do it like that. Now, for example, cremastic reflex. You take the back of the hammer and do it like this in the medial aspect of the thigh. Just scratch it slightly. The testicle goes up. The testicle goes up. That's called cremastic reflex. The patient is surprised. How he did not raise his testicle and how did the testicle go up? That's the time the patient develops faith in the doctor. That this doctor has got something. The whole practice of general practice runs on faith, believe me. Medicines, really speaking, don't work. It's either the passage of time and that faith. How do you create the faith? You can't buy faith. You can't create faith. These are the indirect methods to create faith. Deep reflexes and then visceral reflexes about urine, sex, etc. So, the, what I am saying is, for GPs, all this not required. But there are days, even up to now, even at this age, if I've got 10 appointments and only 6 patients come on that day. So you see how much time I've got at my disposal. Then uh, My timing is same. So I have to spend that much time in the consulting room. What I will do? I'll start doing nervous system examination of every patient. He doesn't know what what, what I am doing? You know, I am examining him, no? In the examination, MBBS, they gave one hour for neurology case. Half an hour for all other cardiac, elementary. So, you can spend one hour in examining the whole nervous system. So, you are revising your skill. But the patient is impressed. The patient is impressed that your, the hand goes up when you hit him. That this doctor has got some. There starts the faith. So you use this weapon of neurology on those days when they slack season, slack season, to create more faith. But today, what we are going to do is what GP should know about neurology. First thing is fainting. Moment the patient faints. Everybody thinks call a brain doctor, but it's not. Actually, vasovagal attack is a common. I've taken this one-hour lecture in the past on fainting. That the commonest cause is vasovagal. But vasovagal means what? Your vagus is weak, so it can become a neurology case. Otherwise, if it is not that, then there is arrhythmias, and for arrhythmias, you got the best Holter monitoring. You may not send him to a neurologist, send him to the hospital to put a holter. And they put their, it's like a, a, a mobile cam, your mobile, they put it here, right? Patient goes home, comes after 24 hours. So any arrhythmias which have caused fainting can be picked up. And then I told you about maturation syncope. It's a dramatic thing. They call, call the neurologist, call specialist. Because the patient went to pass urine and fell down and injured himself. Picturation, syncope. The next very commonest neurological symptom is headache. No, headache is a neurological symptom. 
And I've taken again a full lecture on headache. In the end, I told you, chronic headaches. Chronic headaches are either migraine or tension headaches or combination. So you can do a CT scan and, and confirm. This patient comes to you again after th three, four months. Headaches have not gone. So again, if he comes after a long period, and if by chance he says, doctor, few days back I had something like that, or something like that. What was that? That was a focal fit. If any of these headache patients gets a convulsion like epilepsy, or any focal fit, any abnormal, that patient headache, you have seen him, you, you did a CT scan four, four months back, that patient has got SOL, space occupying lesion. What is your role? This patient will go to some chalu neurologist or somebody or beginner who will threaten him, you got a brain tumor, we'll have to operate, maybe cancer, maybe something, I don't know. We have to cut and see. And then he comes to you crying because you are his family doctor. When you see such a patient, you tell him, no, he's wrong. I can bet you have either got a neurocysticercosis or tuberculosis or a subdural hematoma. I did this last time and I am stressing it again. Neurocysticercosis is the commonest cause of this convulsion. You can treat it with albendazole, medical treatment, no operation, nothing. Tuberculosis, anti-tuberculosis drugs. Subdural hematoma, put a needle, remove the blood clot, finish. So you tell the patient gets so much faith in you and he trusts you. And it comes out that when he is investigated, it's one of these three things and not a brain tumor. So you see your role as a GP in such a patient. This is about headache. And then giddiness, I took a full lecture on giddiness. And I try to tell you severe giddiness is vertigo going round and round. And then I explain to you that the commonest cause of vertigo is benign positional Sorry, uh, I'm going that. No. I try to tell you that the commonest cause of vertigo, the common, most common, is positional vertigo, which is called as BPPV. In any paroxysmal positioning vertigo. Position of the vertigo has got fluid. When the head moves, you get vertigo. So patient is going on the, to sleep in the bed, puts his head down, vertigo. Or in the morning he gets up and moment he put. At night he turns the position here, turns the position there, vertigo. It can be very bad vertigo. In a very bad vertigo patient in the morning, he can't walk, he can't balance, he's so frightened. Anyhow, you shouldn't get worried because it's, you, sh you, you should make sure it's related to the change of position. And this BPPV can come again and again. Please remember that. But today I'm going to talk about giddiness in a vertigo in an elderly person. Say 60 years old, diabetic, hypertensive, drunkard, smoker, tobacco eater, no exercise. Such a man, if he gets an attack of vertigo and not related to the position, he has got a brain lesion. He has got a brain lesion because in the brain stem, we call it a central lesion. If there is any less blood supply, a tumor or something, it will be one attack of vertigo and patient will be completely nervous, whole family, call doctor, call ne neurologist. Vertigo comes from the brain stem. Brain stem is what? This much. Brain is this much. But the brain stem is only this much. But today we can investigate this brain stem. We have got facilities to do that. 
which we didn't have in the past. For example, electrical studies, brain stem auditory evoked potential studies, beta studies. We can do electrical studies and find out there is a lesion in the brain stem which causes this vertigo. So what is that lesion? The commonest is TIA, transient ischemic attack of the brain. It's like angina pectoris, but there could be tumor, demyelination. All I am saying is, a vertigo attack in an elderly person, long-standing diabetic, long-standing hypertensive, smoker, drunkard, not doing it. Please, this is your first diagnosis. Don't think of BPPV. And uh, it's very easy to teach like this. You are highly impressed. But try to do it in the private practice. Let me see. You won't be able to achieve this. Patient says, how much money for this? 5,000. How much money for this? 15,000. How many patients can spend 20,000 rupees? So you are his family doctor. You know his capacity. So you tell him that. Okay. Let us not do the investigations. If you trust me, if you have faith in me, start taking small dose of aspirin. Either 75 milligram, 100 milligram, 150 milligram. All these are available depending on whatever you want to give. Nothing, but it should be small dose. Not 300 milligram. And if you start that, this patient has to continue that for a few years maybe. If you don't go, one day he will get a major attack. Yet brainstem has got all lower cranial nerves. It has got all the four limbs, fibers. He can get completely paralyzed. So this is about symptom of vertigo. Then very common condition. The patient is brought to you. He, he was all right in the morning. Now he is confused. He doesn't recognize you. He doesn't know what he is doing. Suddenly confused. Elderly man. The commonest cause is low blood sugar in a diabetic patient. The patient is diabetic and he must be on insulin or not even insulin, even oral drugs. That with a, some variation, the blood sugar goes down. And if you give intravenous glucose to this patient, not even by mouth, they recover. So very impressive because in the beginning that they think the patient will have to take to the hospital. He can't recognize people, he can't, he's talking nonsense, he, there must be some serious illness. The second commonest cause is drugs, remember that. Any sedatives which the patient is taking, suspect them, exclude them. And the rest of the thing, of course, sodium, potassium, 12 blood tests, kidney, liver, all these conditions can cause. Another important thing which you should know is, you always do SpO2. And if the SpO2 is low in a COPD patient, he can have confusion. And then infection. You see, these old people, so often they have no fever and there is infection. For example, urine infection, women, so common, no fever, even in men. Lung infection, pneumonia, you can have a pneumonia with hardly any fever, little fever, 99. So you have to make sure that the X-ray chest is normal. Urine is normal. And finally, you patient, if the confusion remains a longer time, all these things are not there, CT scan has to be done. Because a stroke can produce confusion only. A stroke, subdural hematoma is notorious for causing only confusion. Slight headache which you don't give any importance to. So this confusion is a GP problem. You, it's not a specialist. Specialists won't see these patients. Who goes to the specialist? Which specialist will he go to? I want to know that. And a neurologist will not think of lung, will not think of urine infection, will not think of oxygen, anoxia. It is you who are master in this. This is the GP practice, which you should be very good in this. Unconscious patient brought. See, yes, you can always say, oh, 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 leke jau, hospital mein leke jau. Patient unconscious. But you can spend five minutes in trying to give 
relation, relations, some hint of will he live, will he die, what has he got, where should you go? And an unconscious patient, patient, I can challenge you, I have always said that if you examine only head and neck, don't examine the rest of the body. Don't, they, they start shouting and bring the CNS tray, bring the hammer, bring ophthalmoscope, bring this, bring, no, nothing. You need nothing. Only your hands, your eyes. This is the area in an unconscious patient. You will find out the cause like this. Why is he unconscious? For example, I'll give you an example. You see this hair nowadays, people grow so much hair, big hair. You separate out the hair. Look for any blood clot. If there is a blood clot, then he has got a brain. Somebody must have knocked him out. Some car, somebody and run away. He has got a brain contusion there. You come forward, put your hand on the forehead. Very high fever, very high fever. In the books they say pontine hemorrhage and this and that. But in our country, cerebral malaria. Cerebral malaria is the commonest cause of unconsciousness and a very high fever. And if you give them all these intravenously drugs, intravenous, you, they can survive, otherwise they die. So we put the hand and there is some fever, some fever, not very, very high fever. Some, immediately go to the neck. Look for neck stiffness. Look for neck stiffness. Suppose there is a neck stiffness and he has got meningitis. There is meningitis. You have to do water from the back, lumbar puncture and make a diagnosis in the hospital and treat. If it is not meningitis, it will be subarachnoid hemorrhage. Same story. That patient has, patient cannot speak. No relations have come. Nobody knows. Did he have a severe headache and then he became unconscious? No. So history is not available which is the most important part and which is your drawback that you are trying to diagnose without history the patient. Alright, look at the forehead, look at some scars, scar. if there is a scar here, a scar there, this patient may be an epileptic. Epilepsy is the commonest cause of unconsciousness. After the attack, the unconsciousness can last for 15 minutes, half an hour, one hour, Open the mouth and look at the gums. If the gums are hypertrophic, then the patient is on dilantin sodium for epilepsy. He has omitted the, his medicines for some time, few days, and he got a fit. So you can tell the relations. Most likely, I am telling you, this is an attack of epilepsy. Don't worry, don't hurry to the hospital. Within an hour or so, he will become normal. What a relief! What a, what a diagnosis the GP has made. And some of these doctors who don't do this, they become fools because they do lumbar puncture, they say, in the end, epilepsy. The history comes, the relations come. Sab ho to, usko to mirgi ki hai. You feel embarrassed with the wrong diagnosis. And then, of course, you look at the conjunctiva of the patient. Conjunctiva. So, patient is unconscious, you can always raise the eye, eye, eyebrows, Look at the peripheral conjunctiva. If it is yellow, he has got hepatic coma. He has to go to a liver intensive care unit if you want to save his life. You see, it's very funny. This jaundice is due to viral hepatitis. This viral hepatitis is rampant in our country. Rampant. And you know, there are varieties of this viral hepatitis presentation. Some patient may have just slight loss of appetite. Some patient may have so much vomiting. There's some, and some patient, the viral hepatitis starts within second, third day. They, their body is called is fulminant necrosis of the liver due to the virus. Virus E in adults, E in children. And when this occurs, it occurs so fast. Within 24 hours, the patient is unconscious. And it's a case of hepatic coma. Now you send him to a liver intensive care unit. And then look at the pupils. This is the, on, the only instrument which helps you is the torch. 
And when you see the toys, if the people are very, very small, maybe opium poisoning, people are very big, belladonna poisoning, datura poisoning, so common. And if the pupils are unequal, which doesn't need experience to see, you are seeing the size of the people, then he has got some blood clot in the brain. And then you look at this face here, this nasolabial fold, nasolabial fold, in which in the end of the lecture you will see it, you will become very strong in your eliciting the sign. The nasolabial fold should be equal. If one nasolabial fold is like this, unconscious patient, then he has got a paralysis on the opposite side and it's a case of hemiplegia. You don't have to examine the... You can't examine, no. He's unconscious. You can't tell him, raise the hand, raise the foot. You diagnose hemiplegia. And if it is a middle-aged person, hypertensive, diabetic, that's the commonest diagnosis of unconsciousness. With a cerebral hemorrhage. And then, of course, you go near the patient and smell the mouth. <gasps> smell! If you can smell whiskey, it's alcoholic coma. If you can smell the like urine, it's uremic coma. If you can smell like a foul, a rotten fruits, it's a diabetic coma. What, or what I want to tell you is, I cannot spend more time on this, but unconscious patient is a GP's problem. First, he should go through GP, then specialist. And which specialist? You will decide. So you see, you have got a big role as a GP, even in an unconscious patient. There is one disease which is diagnosed only by spe GPs, not specialists. Specialists will never see this patient because these are the patients with peculiar illness, not very common, but in one or two years you might see one patient or two patients, young patients young patient, either boys or girls or young men, women. And the history is what? The patient was normal. He was playing, he went to the school, he, went to, he was playing games. When he came back, he said, my legs are weak. And he tries to go to bathroom. He can't walk. He can't walk. He's paralyzed. Now, how can a young man who has done everything normal get suddenly, you find, he is paralyzed. He cannot go to the bathroom. He can't walk. Sometimes even the hands, he can't hold the cup. In olden days, in the books they used to write that hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Now that hypokalemic word has been removed. We used to think, see this potassium, potassium. Potassium is a very important component in the body for muscles. Skeletal muscles, heart muscles, heart muscles. If potassium is very low, patient can die. With the heart will stop. If potassium is very high, patient heart can stop and die. Jai Prakash Narayan, what he was declared dead. And when the urologist came, the nephrologist came, he found the potassium very very low. He pumped in the potassium, survived. The dead man became alive. Potassium is very important in the body. So, skeletal muscles also. If you have got no potassium, you cannot. Power has no meaning. So, we used to think that low potassium causes this paralysis. And this paralysis lasts usually for a few hours only. Usually, half day, one day, two days, they become normal. They become normal. Now, if it is due to low potassium, they need potassium. If it is due to high potassium, they need another treatment to lower the potassium. In a GP practice, you can't do this. To estimate the potassium levels, to follow up, best thing is don't do nothing. Just give them beta blockers. Any propylene and all. And you will see majority of them will recover. Majority of them have got a low potassium type of paralysis which recovers by itself. If you try to give intravenous potassium, uh, how do you know you are not giving more potassium? And more potassium will again cause... No. If you want to prevent these attacks in the relations, I worry 
you can give them beta blockers for a long time, three months, four months. So it's a beautiful example of a how a GP can do in neurology, which a specialist cannot do. Then we, a, every GP should know what is the root pain. If you don't know what is the root pain, don't practice, don't do general practice. Whenever there is pain in the body, anywhere, pain here, pain here, pain here, pain here, pain here. We think of muscle, this, ligament, sprain, injury, infection, this. No, one differential diagnosis is root pain. Whether you've got a pain here, you think of oil bladder, liver abscess, this. For all you know, it may be root pain. Root, what is root? Nerves, nerves, everybody knows nerves. We all nerves, everybody knows nerves. But the nerves come from where? The nerves are formed from the roots. So from the spinal cord, spinal, vertebral column, what comes out is not a nerve. What comes out is a root. And these roots then combine together, two, three, four, to form a nerve which comes here, which you can see. Root you can't see. There is no difference between the pain of a nerve and a root, root, root pain, except that the root pain has got a specific area which you can diagnose. Somebody has got a pain here in the shoulder, here, deltoid. Oh, so somebody that a cardiologist says maybe angina, it may be unstable angina, do angiography. Somebody else says is this, that, arthritis, frozen shoulder. But if you find some sensations are lost in this area, this is a C5 root which is being pressed in the cervical column. And it's the pain coming from there. You treat that spondylosis. That is a good treatment. So you treat spondylosis or physiotherapy, give it rest, etc. But the roots, cervical roots, thoracic roots. So, now, suppose severe pain here, nobody can diagnose. Somebody says, God better, God better normal, liver, liver normal, the it, ascending colon is normal. You ask for a test called as electrical studies. Somatosensory Evoked Potential Studies, SSEP. I don't think in your towns there can be more than one person who can be doing this, maybe two. Some big hospitals will be doing it. But if you send there, and if you find that this test is positive, then, then this pain is coming from the roots 11 T11, T12. You follow that area. Take an MRI and CT scan of that area. There may be tumor. There may be osteoarthritis. Sacral, lumbosacral roots. Sciatica. What is sciatica? Sciatica is not a nerve pain. Sciatica is a root pain. The, the roots which are L5, S1 are being pressed in the lumbar area and the patient gets. So every GP must know what is root pain. Any pain anywhere, think of rare cause, root pain. And nerve conduction studies will help you. And then we come to the root pain, which is the commonest root pain, is sciatica. So in sciatica, the patient says the backache goes down the leg. And once the backache goes below the knee, knee into the foot, that we label as sciatica. So in sciatica, we say do straight leg raising sign. So you take the leg, make it straight and raise it, raise it. And if the patient after 40 degrees, 40, oh, 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 then he's got sciatica. But if you can do it completely, no sciatica, finish, gone. The trouble is that this positive sign can be misleading. There are other conditions where it can be positive. Arthritis of the hip, etc., etc. So, I would suggest you do one more test. After doing this, you do this. You take your hand put and try to do dorsiflex the foot. Moment you dorsiflex the foot, the straight legs raising sign becomes more positive by doing this. 
and once you have done this test, your diagnosis of sciatica becomes more more common. I mean, more likely. There is nothing like 100% specificity of these signs. These signs are very sensitive, but they are not very specific. So you do dorsiflexion then all again, and then with dorsiflexion, you not only get the your diagnosis. The treatment, the treatment is complete bed rest on your heart bed for two to four weeks. Formerly we used to give six weeks, then we made four weeks. And then we made two, three weeks, too much rest is not good. If you send this patient for MRI or to a neurologist or to a surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, they will say operation. They will all, because after all they have to survive. You have to, you are surviving, they must survive and they will survive only by operation, no? So they will ask for operation. Operation, costly not very good in the sense that there are some residual things which take place after the operation. But you have to now tell the patient, patient will trust you, ki doctor, shall I get operated? Shall I get operated? How will you answer? This is the thing which will help you to answer. You tell the patient to raise the big toe, you put pressure there and Tell him to raise it up, raise it up. If he cannot raise it up, that patient should go for surgery. That means there is too much compression. If he can raise up beautifully, forget it, no surgery at all. But if he cannot, so it's a beautiful sign for a GP to decide whether surgery is required. Of course the pain is there, so patient says I have got so many, so you do bed rest. Okay, you do bed rest, then there is interventional treatment you must try. And this is transforaminal epidural steroid injection. Steroids, see th these patients in the uh, MRI people get foxed, they get misguided because they see the compression. But an M MRI man cannot know that this, there is some edema there in the nerve root L4, L5, L5, S1. Edema and the, the treatment of any edema like that, the best treatment is steroid. And if you can put steroid in the local, in that area rather than by mouth, dramatic relief of pain, dramatic. Now the question comes for the GP, where should he send for this epidural steroid injection? Take it from me, I have got a large experience, anesthetist. Anesthetist, not only we give epidural anesthesia, no? Even for a total knee replacement, they give epidural anesthesia. They are very good in finding out epidural injection. And all these anesthetists in India, they are not paid very well. The surgeons borrow most of the money, pocket in their pocket, they pay them very little, one third, one fourth, etc. So those poor fellows, anesthetists must make some money. So many of them do general, general practice in the evening to make some extra money. These are the anesthetists who should be sent your patients for this injection. And once you give the injection, very good relief for a few weeks, maybe you may need a second injection. But the operation, most of the operations have got a failed low back surgery syndrome, 40%. That means after the operation they have some symptoms which are due to the operation. Avoid it as much as possible, but provided your clinical signs you are sure. You suspect meningitis, the patient got headache. This is the way in which you do neck stiffness. This is the way in which you do look for a neck stiffness. If neck stiffness is there, it's got meningitis. Sometimes in subarachnoid hemorrhage also. This is the sign for the leg you do, which is not straight leg raising sign, which is a flexed knee you are trying to straighten, you cannot, but less important. Then ataxia in elderly, elderly. So many patients come with ataxia. There are so many causes of ataxia, but are they curable causes? TSH, if you got hypothyroidism, 
I have seen only one patient who came from the village, marked hypothyroidism, exedema, like, and ataxia. And I knew I can remove his ataxia by giving him thyroid. But nowadays, TSH is done routinely, you will not find. B1, B12 deficiencies supposed to cause, you can do the levels, D3. Everybody has got a low, low D3. Whom are you going to diagnose ataxia due to vitamin D3? There is one condition where they, most of these people will say it is ataxia in the elderly man due to this and they want to operate. Orthopedic surgeon will say they want to operate. These are elderly people who have got a backache which goes to the thighs, buttocks. They have got claudication. This is nothing else but angina pectoris of the legs. Please remember, both the legs. Huh? The patient is walking. He gets pain in both the legs and the thighs. He, so much so, he has to stop. When he stops, the pain stops. This, this is like a nyana pectoris. Same like a nyana pectoris. So, when you are examining them, you will find no physical signs. But this history, that he walks, he gets those pains, he stops, the pain disappears. Now, these people have definitely got lumbar canal stenosis. This lumbar canals, some, most of many people have from birth only it's a small canal. But in the old age, because of the osteoarthritis and the osteophytes, it becomes more narrow. So they want to do laminectomy, surgeons want to do. I'm not very happy with the operation. I would rather advise them lose some weight, do physiotherapy, rather than widening of the spinal canal. But if it comes to, you can widen the spinal canal and the patient can recover. Then we come to the cranial nerves. Very easy, very easy. And there are few cranial nerves which you should know, not all, not 1 to 12. Sixth cranial nerve. If it is paralyzed, the patient's symptom is diplopia. He is saying double. And this diplopia symptom, so he's, he, he's, patient is looking there, talking to somebody normal. Then he suddenly looks there, he sees double, two people. So in certain position, double. Moment the patient complains of this double, he has got six now weakness paralysis. And usually there is a squint. Usually there is a squint. But thing is the squint is common in normal population. So many people are slightly squinted. But they will never have diplopia. Never. Once there is double vision, it is a paralysis. Now, here is a lady. She complains of diplopia. And when I am telling her to look on this side, this eye moves very well. This eye does not move. It doesn't go there. So this is sixth now paralysis very common, so often you find no cause, no cause. Diabetics is common, diabetic, they recover by themselves, passage of time, passage of time. So for passage of time, some doctor will give B1, B12 injection every week, nothing wrong, nothing wrong. But make it every week, not every day, because you want to buy time, passage of time. So by the time 10 injections are over, 10 weeks are over, she's already normal. And she thinks that your injections have worked. In your mind, you know, it is passage of time which has worked. Of course, treat diabetes and all now. Diabetic, this lady came, had come for slight headache. And when I looked at the sometimes low fever, three, four, two, three weeks eh, duration, young girl. And uh, when I examined the neck stiffness, she had slight neck stiffness terminal. But I looked at her eyes and I thought she had a slight squint. So when I said squint, I told her to look on this side. You can see now, this, sorry, here, this eye moves very well, this eye does not move at all. So she had a weakness of the sixth nerve, so cranial nerve paralysis, slight neck stiffness, had a young girl, little low fever, Meningitis and which many TB meningitis because 
pyogenic meningitis comes like this, like this. In one day, patient can die in two days. TB meningitis can go on for weeks before it is diagnosed. But they recover with medical treatment. She recovered beautifully. There is no question of that. So then there is a third nerve paralysis, common in diabetic patients. When the third nerve gets paralyzed, you get ptosis. What is ptosis? What is ptosis? Now here is a woman who has got bilateral ptosis, eyes are drooping. We call them drooping eyes. There are some film actresses who have got slightly drooping eyes. They look beautiful. They, they call it as sexy drooping eyes. So drooping eyes, this is from birth she has got. So this is not a disease, but if one somebody, this merchant who is a say, rich man, but he is a strong diabetic, hypertensive, smoking, drinking, tobacco, one day his left eye close, closes. What is the diagnosis? Third nerve paralysis. And in this third nerve paralysis, if you raise this, you will find that squint there. Very common, it's an, I'm not saying very common uh, complication, but I'm just saying if you find this, yes, you will investigate for the other causes. I'm not saying don't investigate, including HIV and syphilis and brain scanning, etc. Most of the time, everything is normal. It's only diabetes, tell him to stop tobacco, this, alcohol, etc. Treat diabetes properly. Within few weeks, they recover completely, the eyes open up. Another patient, same story, diabetic patient, one day he suddenly develops, the eye falls down. And this curtain goes down and because his eye falls down, he has no diplopia because he cannot see in that eye. But they all recover, here is another patient who came with the same symptom that eye has fallen down, ptosis, little squint because there is a third nerve paralysis, recovers completely, we need to go on treating your diabetes properly, don't worry. So third nerve paralysis, but what is AOP, the A, I always in every, when we, history taking, what is history taking? You can diagnose most of the illnesses by taking history, not by examination. In the history taking, A, age of the patient, O, onset of the illness, P, progress of the complaint. These are the three things which will make your diagnosis like this. This patient, elderly man, onset, he says in the evenings every day, the eye falls down, this left eye goes down. Sometimes he sees double, sometimes most of the times it is only this falling. Sometimes it falls down so much that he is afraid it will, it will close. Maybe one side, maybe slightly on the other side also. Any complaint which comes in the evening and not in the morning patient is normal. Patient eyes are normal in the morning. Any complaint whether eyes closing or the voice, the voice in the evening the voice become low. You know, this man has got a high voice. What happened to the voice in the evening? He eats so fast, drink, and in the night when he starts eating, drinking, uh, slowly it comes out through the nose. What is happening? In the morning is normal. I have had half a dozen GPs who have telephoned to me, Sir, I diagnosed myasthenia gravis, which was missed by the neurologist. The was very busy, he didn't take the history. You took the history properly. My senior grievous, this patient, he has got this, you give prostrigmine injection. And in five minutes, like magic, eyes become normal. So when I used to take the lectures in the college at night time, I used to bring this patient, I used to show them, then I used to tell them, now we'll have interval, after five, ten minutes interval, come and see this patient. Inject prostrigmine, they come, patient absolutely normal. Beautiful mycelium graves, but diagnosis is made by history. Passage of time, 
is the most important thing. Then there is a fifth nerve. Fifth nerve, so you must know this fifth nerve. The fifth nerve, when it affects the condition is called trigeminal neuralgia. It's a pain, pain in the face. And again the history, most important is history. The pain is in the half of the face, not the full face. The either lower half, upper half or full. And the pain is very severe. If you remember when I told you about herpes zoster chest pain, which radiated like this, and these patients, they do angiography, this, that, they think it's a cardiac pain because there is no physical signs. But in this pain, if you examine the patient, remove the clothes, blouse and all that, they won't allow you to put hand, oh no, no, don't put your hand. They're so sensitive, the pain is so severe that they won't allow you to touch. That is the nerve pain, herpes zoster. This is another nerve pain. The pain is so severe and the best example, imagine Salman Khan, film actor, the, the topmost actor, the richest actor. Poor fellow started getting these pains and he came to my function when I finished my 60 years of teaching and he came at 11 o'clock, there were 1,500 people and they told them that the class is going on from morning 7 o'clock. He came at 11 o'clock. He was shocked. He said, 7 o'clock, these people come in and the doctors said, when will it finish? I said, 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. So he became emotional. And then he said, I will teach you something. He said, I will teach you something today. And then he said that he used to get this pain in the face, severe pain. He said, he went to the dentist. The dentist said, <laughs> something easy. Not better. Second dentist. Third dentist. He said, the pain was so severe, I couldn't put water, I couldn't shave, I couldn't eat, I couldn't touch. Till somebody said, trigeminal neuralgia. Trigeminal neuralgia? What is the treatment? What they say? They can medical treatment, you can take this anti-epileptic drug, carbamazepine, etc., phenytoin, pregabalin, gabalin, gabapentin. For how long? maybe one year, two years, three years, four years, five years. In fact, I have patients of trigeminal neuralgia. They've been taking epilepsy patients, how, how long you give them? 10 years, 15 years, 20. So this can be given for a long time, nothing wrong. And he said, any other treatment? They said, operation. Operation? No, because in the operation, it's a very good operation. You only cut from here and you see the trigeminal the ganglion and if there is something impinging on it, either a vein or an artery, remove that. Finish. Close up. Pain is gone. He said, no. Operation, I am afraid. Then they said, non-surgical treatment, interventional. Operation without cutting. Yes. He said, I am ready. And they took him for this operation to America. Everybody didn't know. It's called as stereotexis surgery and then Salman Khan explained to the whole crowd you know and he says doctors when they put this stereotexic around the forehead it is so tight he says it was so tight I was crying I was crying this they have to do to localize the trigeminal nucleus where the gamma rays will go so they have to be very accurate. And then they put those rays, finished, like magic he recovered. So he nearly broke down and he was telling you doctors, don't miss trigeminal neurology. Finally, <coughs> No GP can become a good GP if he doesn't know what is Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is the commonest paralysis and found in all ages, young girls, boys, adults, married, unmarried, seven now paralysis. You should be 100% good in diagnosing seven now paralysis. And this paralysis of the seventh nerve, 
can occur. We don't know why. We don't, may, maybe virus, we don't know. But there are other causes which you have to exclude, which I'll tell you. To, to know this paralysis you should be very accurate. See, look at the, this. Is not, this is the son of the patient. I took his photograph to show you that see on the forehead, see this line? See this line? Sorry, 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 sorry. 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 <laughs> Yeah. Now, start with the forehead. Look at these lines there. They are equal on both the sides. This is the center. Here equal, 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 equal. Suppose they are not equal. Now like his father who complained of the, what was there? That here they could be seen beautifully. Here they, see, they are going, going, going away. This is first thing. Second thing. I told his son to raise up this forehead. He could do it equal on both sides. Then I told his father, now you do it. He could do on this side. This side, nothing will go up. The forehead will not be stretched. Simple science to diagnose seven of paralysis. Then I told his son to do frowning. You know, frowning, this, frown, sorry, 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 frowning. This frowning. When you are angry, when you are, you do, but everybody cannot do. This, this action everybody cannot do. But he did it beautifully, equal on both sides. Equal on both sides. But when I told his father to do it, he could not do it all, so maybe he has never done it before. Then I told his son to screw his eye. Not close, the doctor will say, Ankh band karo. No, Ankh band karo like this. This is called Ankh band karo. Screw, screw the eyes tight. You are looking at the power. And this son can do this beautifully. And I told his father to do. He could not close his right eye at all. And this I remain open even at night time, so when they sleep you should cover it, otherwise they will get infection. That means that I is paralyzed. And then I tell this son, show me the teeth. Word, word. Show the teeth. And you see the nasolabial fold. Equal on both sides. Angles of the mouth, equal on both sides. And tell his father to do it, see what happened. I said, show your teeth like this. He could raise this side, left side, markedly, right side, nothing, flat. But if you notice, the right side looks go good, the left side looks paralyzed. <laughs> like that. So patients come and the relations come, and doctors are like, like, they call this as paralyzed side. But this looks normal. This looks funny, abnormal. That is the beauty of the seven nerve paralysis. And other thing is, the eye becomes bigger. Because of the paralysis, there could be little watering from there because the punctus comes out, little watering from there. And then this angle of the mouth, see, when he contracts, this angle is low. This angle is high, so the saliva can come out from here. This is the seven nerve paralysis. And now, next I tell this son, blow, mm, mm, blow. He can blow equally on both sides, beautifully. Then I tell the father to blow. What happens? What happens? The blowing is markedly noticed only on the paralyzed side, not on the normal side. Why? Because there is no tone, there is no tone. It's a paralyzed, sorry, it's a paralyzed face. So the air pushes it. The eyes are slightly bigger than the normal because of paralysis. And then I tell him to whistle. Then I tell his father to whistle. 
he just cannot visit. He visit on the very side, opens, air comes, he cannot visit. The seventh nerve paralysis. Here is another man, and I tell him to show the teeth. You, you can do only one test, good, good test in your fast. Show your teeth. Now what happens? First of all, you see his eye. That eye, this eye looks much bigger than this eye. That because this gets retracted because it's paralyzed, and it water comes out, tears. But now when he contracts, this is beautiful. This, so you can see this nasolabial fold is markedly present. This nasolabial fold is minimal. And this angle comes down, this angle goes up. So he has no left-sided paralysis, he has a right-sided paralysis. Now there are other causes of seven nerve paralysis. There can be a tumor, this, that. There can be, but the commonest diabetes, hypertension, syphilis, AIDS, etc. But the commonest cause is Bell's paralysis. Only one thing you have to exclude that the ear causes middle ear infection. If he has got a scar, somebody is operated, the ENT surgeon, then he has developed paralysis. If there is a tumor here, one hint I will give you, spend time on one minute on examining the inside of the ear canal. Examine the ear properly, whatever side is paralyzed. If you find even ache, he complains of pain there, pain here, pain here, stiffness of the neck, redness, redness some red, some vesicle like herpes, one or, one or two vesicles only maybe on the ear, on the that is very important to tell you that this Bell's paralysis is due to herpes zoster. And herpes zoster, we have got treatment. So the treatable, treatable Bell's paralysis, don't miss it. And if you don't want to spend time, you're busy or you don't want to do it, then give both the drugs. Give herpes drugs also. But actually, what is the treatment? In the past, people have mistreated, wrongly treated, and therefore these people are left with so many um, drawbacks. It's a, in my language, it's a medical emergency. What is the emergency? Treatment must start within first three days, and the, the, the treatment is steroids. And steroids in what dose? 60 to 80 milligram. 60 to 80 milligram. The earlier you start, the earlier the relief. The later you start, won't work. And give, give this dose for one week. And after one week, you taper off. Excellent improvement. And every patient, when you, you are not sure of herpes, you can give Bella Cyclovir 1000 milligram three times a day for one week. Nothing wrong in that. Nothing wrong in giving both. Now, the beauty of this Bell's paralysis 60% patient complete recovery. And what you should not, when, we, when should you not treat this patient and send them to a neurologist? That's very important. Don't take any patient under your care if he has got 100% palsy. If there is not the slightest movement, slightest movement, don't treat this patient. If he has got severe initial pain, if he is old patient, old patient, don't try to treat because there could be other neurological causes. Such patients should be referred to specialists. Otherwise, in my clinic, for example, I call them at the end of one month. The recovery is plus plus. They are already happy. They are more or less recovered. When I call them at the end of second month, nearly 100% normal. Call them third month, 100% normal. See this recovery after, say, second month, for example. All the movements they recover, closing the eyes, screwing the eyes, showing the teeth, everything, everything. But there is one movement which will tell you that he is not 100% recovered and that is the blinking. See, normally when we are looking at somebody and talking, we, the eyes blink and they blink symmetrically. 
absolute symmetrically, 100 percent. If somebody blinks and other eye blinks little late, even a few seconds late, that eye is recovering from paralysis or it is left over permanently. And I, it happened, Bell's paralysis, Anupam Kher, film actor, he got Bell's paralysis. When he was on the top, he was a very good actor. When he got it, he broke down. He thought he was finished. He used to laugh and like that, he used to laugh and people used to, and he said, I'm, now I cannot be an actor. I'm finished. He was broken down and only after three months when he recovered completely, he's a beautiful actor, top actor, another film actor, very diabetic and he developed facial paralysis. Nothing else, so it was sure it was bad. So the doctor was not willing to give steroid because diabetic, and last time I told you, even in diabetic patient, hypertension, is this 60, 80 milligram dose in le for the less than three weeks is nothing. It will not change the sugar, etc. Anyhow, I told this man on the telephone, you start this before I come. Recovery was excellent. And then I told this film actor, Randir Kapoor, I said, you come on the stage and show my students and doctors your relief. And then I told the crowd, when he comes, he will be, he will praise me. He will say that 100 percent I recovered fast. But I say, look at the blinking, blinking. When he's talking, you will see the blink in that eye is slightly less. And I said, don't tell him, don't laugh, don't do anything. Then he came and he was telling them, the doctors how we have this and dramatic, I could not do this, this. But everybody noticed that blinking on the paralyzed side was slightly poor, less slow. Some people have this lasting permanently. Permanently. They, when they blink, you can make out. He had an old Bell's paralysis. One more last advice to the GPs, you've got another role to play in this patient. Some of them are left with aberrant renovation, unwanted facial movements. You know, in the sense, suppose he had a paralysis on the, the, uh, on the uh, right, uh, right side. He recovered, patient recovered. But what happens is, when he, when he talks, when he does some more, he is, he, uh, or he is blinking, the eye, the face, abnormal movements, looks bad. Look, any girl who is to be married or in the college, she will be so shy. These, so some this blepharospasm, some of them, they, they develop this. I can tell you one thing, as a GP, please advise them to take botulism toxin. Botulism toxin is a beautiful drug. Yes, as everybody is saying, no, 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 it is very costly, 20,000 rupees. What is 20,000 rupees today? Today, a diabetic patient who is taking insulin three times a day, and take tablets, he is spending 5,000 rupees per month, per, per month only on insulin and tablets. Leave aside the other drugs or blood pressure, etc. Nothing 5,000 per month because this effect lasts about 3 to 4 months. But once you give botulism toxin, the moment disappears, patient is no happy, so happy. And these are the patients, the, the faith in you develops more and more. And this is today's passage of time and this is the cranial paralysis. Next time we shall do further. Thank you.